very much, Jim. All right, thank you very much. We'll now move on to our, our next two presentations, which are the, uh, the student design competitions. Uh, the first presentation uh, coming up next is the graduate student design competition winner. Uh, it will be presented by uh, Sehan Gul uh, from the University of Maryland's Caladrius uh, team. You can please pull up uh, Sehan's uh, presentation. In the meantime, I'll introduce him. Uh, Sehan has a bachelor and master's degree from the Middle East Technical University in Ankara, Turkey. He's currently a PhD student at the University of Maryland working with Dr. Anubhav Dada. His research is on prediction and improvement of prop order world flutter and air resonance characteristics. He was the graduate student design team leader in 2019 and his team won first place in the 36th VFS student design competition for the design of an extreme altitude mountain rescue vehicle. Uh, Sehan, please begin when you are ready. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, do I have keyboard access? I don't seem to be able to switch slides. Nick, could we please give keyboard access to Sehan? All right, now it's working. Okay. Good afternoon and thank you for the introduction. I will now present Caladrius, our extreme altitude mountain, mountain rescue vehicle design. In short, the objective was to answer the following question in the RFP this year, well, the last year. What would a rotor craft specifically designed for extreme altitude rescue missions look like? Well, the answer is Calabrius, named after a snow white bird from Roman mythology that has healing abilities. Calabrius is unlike any other helicopter that's currently operational. I will explain the design shortly, but first, let me talk about the mission profile given by the RFP. The rotorcraft starts the mission at an international airport at 4,600 feet. After taking off with three crew, that's pilot, hoist operator who was also a pilot, and an EMS specialist, and 330 pounds of EMS equipment, it climbs to 12,400 feet, cruises for 73 nautical miles, and lands at a smaller airport near the mountain to refuel. Now, leg two here is the most important mission, most important leg of the mission. After taking off from the small airport, the rotorcraft climbs to 29,100 feet, hovers out of ground effect for 30 minutes, and picks up two people. Then it descends back to the smaller airport for refueling. Lake 3 is essentially the same as Lake 1, except the cruise altitude this time is 4,600 feet. This whole mission needs to be completed in less than three hours. These altitude and distance values correspond to a rescue operation at Mount Everest, which has a summit altitude of 29,029 feet. The international airport is in Kathmandu, Nepal, and the small airport is the Siangbocha airport again in Nepal. After extensive research about Mount Everest, it was understood that the problem is actually quite serious. In fact, in 2019 alone, 11 climbers died due to overcrowding near the summit. Effective search and rescue means will be even more important in the future as the number of climbers increase. In order to understand the terrain and the weather conditions even better, some of us flew to France and interviewed Mr. Didier de Salle, who is the only pilot to land on Mount Everest in his world record flight in 2005. Therefore, he is very knowledgeable about the mountain. However, his flight was not a rescue effort. For that, we also visited Air Zermatt's facilities in Switzerland and interviewed one of their pilots, Samuel Sommermatter. Air Zermatt is a search and rescue company operating at Matterhorn. They perform hundreds of rescue operations every year, and they have a lot of experience in this field. We also visited Baltimore County Police Aviation Unit and Maryland State Police Aviation Command. We learned about the search equipment they use and the detailed internal layout of their helicopters. Equipped with all this knowledge, it was time to design the rotorcraft. First step was to choose the configuration. After determining the design drivers, the most important configurations were analyzed against them qualitatively. Eventually, a single main rotor configuration was chosen 
due to good hover efficiency, which was very important for this mission. High gas tolerance, even with the presence of the tail rotor. Low downwash for the safety of the rescuees. High agility for the rescue operation and low empty weight. After configuration selection, the next step was the preliminary vehicle sizing. We used the AFDD weight models for this task. Here, I just wanted to give you a snapshot of how we sized the vehicle. In order, to, in order to choose the aspect ratio and number of blades, we created the carpet plot that you see in this chart. Here, blade loading and tip speed are kept constant, minimizing the footprint and design gross takeoff weight were our objectives. We see here converged design points for different number of blades and aspect ratio values. Increasing the aspect ratio decreases both the gross takeoff weight and disc value, but we can only increase it so much for structural design purposes. For the same aspect ratio, Increasing the number of blades decreases the gross takeoff rate, but increases the disc loading, which is not desired. A low downwash, and so low disc loading is desired for the safety of the rescuees in terms of their stability and also avalanche and whiteout. We discarded designs with three blades or less because of high gross takeoff rate and large diameter rotor. Keeping the rotor craft compact was one of the most important feedbacks we got from the pilots. Six or more blades were also discarded due to high disc loading. The final design point is shown with a star here. Aspect ratio of 19 is a typical value. The decision was mainly for whether we should go with four blades or five blades. Five blades provided lower weight and lower rotor diameter. The installed power for five blades is slightly higher, but the advantages outweigh this issue. Secondary benefit of five blades is lower vibrations, which may be important for the EMS personnel in the, in the helicopter. Another trade study was performed for the tip speed. Based on the equation above, as the tip speed increases, disc loading must increase for constant blade loading. Number, for constant blade loading, number of blades and aspect ratio. Therefore, installed power also increases as you see in the figure left. However, gross takeoff weight decreases as seen in the figure right due to lower blade weight. The problem is that tip speed cannot be increased too much. Otherwise, compressibility starts becoming an issue in high-speed crews. We can avoid compressibility by decre decreasing the rotor speed, but more than 15% decrease results in higher specific fuel consumption. In addition, high tip speed means high disc loading, as I mentioned, which increases the induced flow and not desired. Based on this trade-off, the tip speed is decided as 760 feet per second, which gives a maximum tip mark number of 0.85 in cruise. The rotor speed is reduced 12% for the first leg and 7% for the third leg of the mission. This reduction is done from the engine, so the transmission is not a variable speed transmission. Now I want to explain the special features of Caladrius before going into the design of each system. Caladrius's main and tail rotor blades were aerodynamically optimized for this extreme altitude mission. It has a five-bladed bearingless main rotor with a radius of 22.6 feet, which corresponds to a disc loading of less than five pounds per speed square. The hub is bearing this for high agility during rescue and low drag during high speed cruise. The large tail rotor was designed for low power consumption, but also for high wind speeds observed at the, mount of, at the summit of Mount Everest. The tail boom was sized, not only to satisfy CS and FAA requirements, but also for extreme gas conditions. Effective search and rescue equipment, such as a searchlight and thermal camera were selected and their weights and power requirements were included in the design calculations. High field of view is very important as we found out from the pilot interviews. Floor windows and a large side bubble window with the lowest aerodynamic penalty uh, were designed. Let's start taking a closer look with the main rotor. The blade design is special. It had to be designed not only for extreme altitude hover, but also high speed flight. The rotor performance was calculated with many different airfoils and blade geometries. Each point seen in this chart corresponds to a different blade design. The design point was chosen for minimum weight and lowest rotor radius for compactness. The final design includes a sweep, an head drill to reduce blade vortex interaction, bilinear twist, and an unconventional taper with two airfoils along the span. A high flap frequency was required for control authority, but not too high like BO105 for gas tolerance. A bearing the sub was decided to achieve this frequency and to accommodate the lag damper required for ground resonance. Bearing the sub also provides robustness, low drag, and low part count. The hub is soft in plane to alleviate the cordwise bending loads. 
we use 3D finite element analysis to make sure the blades have sufficient fatigue life under the operating loads. The lag frequency is 0.72 per rev and the first torsion frequency is 3.4 per rev. This brings us to the control system design. The rotor controls are traditional, but the swash plate was sized for high control loads due to the special airfoils. We started with the design shown in the upper picture and converged to the final design shown in the, showed in the lower. It was aimed to save as much weight as possible. Here you can see a cross section of the main rotor blade. The cross section design was a challenge to accommodate the blade geometry, especially the taper and the twist. We use standard materials, but the most important feature here is the electrothermal de icing system. Different types of systems were analyzed, and the electrothermal de icing system was found to have the lowest weight impact on the design. Hence, Based on public domain and was readily available, a de-icing strip was included at the leading edge of the blade to ensure low vibrations and no performance loss due to icing. Rotor dynamic design was difficult because rotors needed to operate at three different rotation speeds at the three different legs of the mission for minimum mission time. We made sure that there is no resonance in any of these rotor speeds. In addition, even though it's not required in the RFP, we anticipated a possible snow landing condition at or near the rescue area. The lag damper was chosen based on low terrain damping on the snow to be free from ground resonance. Here, bearing the sap helps because it's easier to place the damper. Now that the main rotor is finished, let us continue with the second import system on the helicopter, the tail rotor. The tail rotor also utilized the bearing sap for low part count and protection from snow and debris. The required power to hover at high altitude had a very big impact on the overall weight and size of the rotorcraft due to the engine lap rate. Therefore, the tail rotor also had to be very, very efficient in hover. For this reason, unconventional blades with a twist angle of minus 20 degrees were designed. High disc area also helps achieve low power consumption, but then vorticity state starts becoming a problem with high side winds that are observed at the summit. The blade platform design was performed with this trade-off, and it was made sure that the tail rotor is free from a vortex sink state and loss of tail rotor effectiveness in winds up to 44 knots at the summit. Both main and tail rotors need to be powered. This brings us to the transmission design. The transmission was designed to reduce 6, to reduce 6,000 RPM of engine output to 320 RPM at the main rotor. Because low weight was very important, a weight minimization process was followed to decide on the number of reduction states and the types of the gears used in these states. The transmission utilized bevel gears for the first stage and planetary gears for the second. In addition, based on our discussions with Bell, we used Ferium C61 for the gear material, and that helped us achieve 50 minutes dry running capability, increasing the overall safety of the helicopter. This can be especially important during the rescue as it will enable the rotorcraft to complete its mission even with no oil to lubricate the gears. Going further down, Power plant selection required careful examination of the most suitable options. The RFP allowed us to change batteries during the stopovers at the small airport. Therefore, we discovered different electric power plant configurations to power the tail rotor. Some kind of electric propulsion had the potential to decrease the tail rotor power consumption by changing the rotor speed at different flight regimes and side winds. Therefore, we examined full turbo shaft, battery powered, generator powered, and fuel cell powered tail rotor options. We eventually decided to go with two Pratt & Whitney turboshaft engines, but I would like to explain the other options we explored as well. Batteries are used to turn the tail rotor in option two. Option three uses a generator to convert the mechanical energy to electric energy, so there are no batteries. Option four uses a fuel cell to generate that electric energy. Options two to four have the benefit of replacing the tail rotor drive system by only wires. However, they resulted in heavier designs than full turboshaft. We could still go with option three if we saw a power benefit in changing the tail rotor speed. As we learned from Mr. Dasale, high winds are prominent at Mount Everest. Therefore, there was a question whether variable tail rotor speed can be beneficial to lower the power consumption. However, we found that this is not really required. In this chart, change of the tail rotor power and uh, change of the tail rotor power with tip speed is shown for different side wind values. As you can see, the tail rotor already operates at the drag bucket for all the side wind cases. So there is really no point in changing your rotor speed. With no weight gain and no power benefit, the best, the best option was for us to go with the full turboshaft configuration. Now that the rotating components are done, 
the airframe had to be designed to carry the loads from them. The tail boom design was performed not only to satisfy CS and FAA requirements, but also specific to this mission. Extreme side winds, updrafts, and downdrafts observed at Mount Everest were considered for maximum load cases, and the factor of safety of 1.8 was achieved with a full finite element analysis. Certification requirements sized the airframe, but the large side windows impacted the design. We used ANSYS for the airframe finite element analysis because it was a standard structural design problem. Now I would like to talk about the aerodynamic design of the fuselage. Due to the transmission limit, minimizing power consumption at high speed cruise was very important. Therefore, we designed the fuselage outer shape very, very carefully. Flow separation at the upsweep region at the back of the fuselage can create suction and as a result, high drag. We realized this problem and went through a couple of iterations for a smooth flow with minimum separation. Collagerus has skid landing gears, best for landing on unprepared surfaces. This of course comes with a drag penalty. We use elliptical cross sections for the crossbars, for the crossbars of the landing gear to decrease this drag. I will talk about the bubble window shortly, but I must mention that it also has a big impact on drag. Iterations were made for this component as well to reduce the, as well to reduce the flat plate area. All these analyses were, were performed using Altair. After the iterations and alterations, we could achieve a flat plate area of 1.2 meters square. This way, Caladrius can fly at 160 knots during the cruise segment of the mission. We used Altair for the aerodynamic design of the Bay Area frame, but we employed our own in-house CFD codes for the design of the rotors and also to make some critical decision, such as the location of the horizontal tail. Here, you can see the vortices trailing from the main rotor blades and their interactions with the airframe during cruise. The location we chose for the horizontal tail resulted in the lowest interaction with main rotor vortices, which increases its effectiveness and decreases vibrations. Now let me talk about that bubble window. After discussing with the pilot, it was understood that high field of view is very important. For this reason, Floor windows and large bubble side windows were designed so that the pilots are aware of everything happening around them. The bubble window is here is especially important because it increases the field of view tremendously. However, it comes with an aerodynamic penalty. The shape of the window was designed for minimum extra drag. Burst strike is a problem that needs to be addressed for lower altitudes. There have also been numerous sightings of bar headed crews over the summit, so it is a problem for high altitudes as well. Therefore, Bird strike analysis was performed with Altair for both the front and the side windows, which also satisfied the certification requirements. This was done to ensure the safety of the, uh, of the helicopter, even when it's flying at its never exceed speed, which is 170 knots. Flight control system design was very important for not only low pilot workload during rescue, but also for extreme gas tolerance and control authority. A model following control system was designed to achieve this purpose. As you can see, when the feedback system is on, the rotor craft responded considerably lower to a 40 knots side gust. There is still five degrees of roll response in about two seconds, but the pilot is, ex pilot is expected to correct it by then. Avionics package was selected for extreme altitude rescue missions and day and night IFR capability, which was another RFP requirement. A weather radar was included so that the pilots can have weather information even when the communications is lost. Radar altimeter is used by the flight control system, and it's important for the rescue phase of the mission. One of the feedbacks from pilot interviews was that clear communication is very important. Therefore, a wireless intercom system with noise cancelling headphones were included in the design. In addition, the icing on the horizontal tail, vertical pin, tail rotor, main rotor, and all the wind chill and wind noise is provided, and their power and weight penalty is taken into account in the calculations. In general, the pilot interviews were very helpful to understand which avionics are essential for this mission. They were also very useful to understand the internal layout of rescue helicopters. Two stretchers are placed side by side with redundant ox oxygen tanks. After calculations, it was decided that the weight and power penalty for a pressurization system is too high, so the crew is also provided with oxygen tank, which is special to this mission. The glass cockpit was designed for day and night IFR capability. Because the helicopter was designed specifically for high altitude search and rescue, the equipment was also selected for this mission. An avalanche detector was included in the design so that the crew can find the rescuees even under snow. 
Electro-optical system with thermal imaging is also added so that the crew can scan a large area with high resolution and turn the cold environment into an advantage to capture the heat signature of the rescuees. Finally, a powerful external searchlight was attached to the aft frame to locate the rescuees even in low light conditions. These equipment are frequently used by Air Zermatt and proven to be very effective. Now let's talk about performance a little bit. Here in the plot on the left, we see altitude versus gross takeoff that Claudius can take off. The gray area is the rotor stall region, so black dashed line is the stall limit, and the blue lines represent the transmission limit for different temperatures. The engine can provide a lot of power in lower altitudes, but the transmission is sized with only 10% margin in order to keep the weight and size minimum. Caladrius can hover at 32,000 feet at its gross takeoff weight, which includes the two extra passengers. So at sea level, Caladrius can hover with a payload greater than 1,600 kilograms. This is limited only by the transmission. There is a lot of stall margin for the rotors. Of course, higher temperatures decreases this payload and lower temperature increases. At the plot on the right, we see Hoge ceiling and design gross takeoff rate of different rotor crafts. We see that Caladrius's Hoge ceiling is twice as high as the others. However, this of course doesn't come free. We have to trade range and endurance to achieve high altitude hover. The design performs best, best at extreme altitudes, but it can be useful for other missions as well. High altitude EMS and high altitude um, surveillance are some of the missions that Caladrius can efficiently perform. It is a good lifter at lower altitudes due to high stall range. Hence, it can be very useful for firefighting with high external payload. Arctic monitoring is another important area for Caladrius. New commercial shipping routes are opening up and short and rescue in this vast area will be very important in the future. To sum up, Caladrius was designed to save lives from the highest peaks of the planet that no other helicopter can currently reach. After interviewing many pilots with different backgrounds, we believe we have designed a pilot helicopter specific to high altitude rescue operations. Finally, I would like to acknowledge all the pilots, rescue teams, and the professionals uh, and, the, and industry professionals for their support. Thank you very much for listening. Now I'll be happy to take questions. All right, thank you very much, Sayal. Um, so the questions box is open for the audience. If you could please type your questions there, I will field them over to Sayal. Uh, we do have one question right away from June Lim. Uh, he's saying very nice comprehensive work. How did you determine the blade section spar design? Um, so we wanted to go with a D spar design because it's 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 kind of the conventional conventional way of doing it. And um, um, we used our own section builder to get the properties and um, it was a it was a problem of um, strength and, and also the frequencies that we wanted to reach. So we did a couple of iterations there. Um, we designed different different shapes and different dimensions, and um, we checked the frequencies and we checked the strength. And after a couple of iterations, we we decided on this um, uh, this type of spar design. Okay. Let's give the audience uh, some time to get their questions in. Okay, so we have a question from Chris Snyder. 
Uh, the bubble window. Um, why did you choose that as opposed to having a, a camera for view? So we did talk with pilots about that and they said camera is nowhere near the performance they get from a bubble window. Actually seeing it versus seeing it from a screen, they said it's very, very different. We do have a camera for the hoist. So looking down the, um, so to kind of watch the hoist operation, but bubble windows is, is very useful to position the helicopter with respect to the people that you know we need to we need to pick up. So that was mostly from the pilot uh, pilot input. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rajneesh Singh is asking, what would you say is the biggest design impact of flying at such high altitude? So. Um, Blade aerodynamic design definitely is very important because the engine lap rate is very high. So it's about uh, 2.7 density. The, the ratio of the density engine lap rate is similar. So we had to very efficiently design the blades, the main rotor blades and the tail rotor too, because we need to excuse, you know, we need to have, minimize our power consumption. Um, one of the important effects is when you design for a high altitude, the helicopter is not as efficient so the figure of merit is not as good for lower altitudes, but that's something we had to live with because then uh, we had to use a high CT over Sigma for the main rotor, high, high blade loading so that it's it's very efficient. But then when you go to lower altitude, it's not as it's not as efficient as you know any other helicopter. So that was a trade-off. So you say that you you looked at uh, several different types of configurations and you ultimately settled in on the the single main motor helicopter. Yes. Um, what were some of the other configurations you looked at, and what was perhaps a close second in configuration type uh, to the SMR? So we did look at tandem, side by side, tip rotor, coaxial, quad rotor, all the different compound types, and um, so you know, anything out there that makes sense for this mission. As I remember, the closest second was the tandem. But tandem is not, so we need to fly at high speeds and tandem was not very efficient because of the interactions of the rotors between them. For um, It wasn't very good for high speed crews, but also the, um, it's very heavy because we need to run a, a, a shaft um, along the fuselage of the a tandem helicopter. So that was the close second. Okay, we have uh, three more minutes if anyone else has a question they'd like to ask. I have a question for you then. Um, did you do any competitive analysis? You know, what what is the what are the helicopters that they use today to do uh, mountaintop rescues? Are they even able to get to these altitudes? And and how does this design compare to uh, the types of, of currently used helicopters to do mountain rescue? So they are using. Um some you know they are using the helicopters that are not designed for those altitudes for high altitude rescues for example at matterhorn i think the altitude is about i want to say ten thousand feet something like that so it's not very efficient to do it just because the rotor is not specifically designed for it there is only one helicopter that reached thirty thousand feet that that was airbus i think h-135 what didier Sale used but he just landed there and took off. So he didn't make a rescue and it was only him and it was actually a bare aircraft. You know, they, they, they took away the seats and everything. So some, um, some companies are working with rescue teams in Switzerland um, to design a rotorcraft only for rescue at high altitudes. 
So this was special about this helicopter. This is the only one that's designed for, for that mission only. That's, it, was, it will perform best at extreme altitude, at extreme altitude rescue missions. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Sale. Um, thank you for the talk. We're going to end it here. If folks have um, more questions, please feel free to reach out to him via the contact info on the website or the app. So now we will move on to our, our final presentation of the afternoon, which will conclude Aircraft Design 3. It is the uh, undergraduate uh, student design competition winning presentation from the University of Maryland as well. Um, if we can please bring that up. Yep. And the presenter will be um, Ben Dobson. Ben uh, graduated from Maryland with a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering last year and promptly after graduation joined Sikorsky as an associate research engineer in the Advanced Concepts uh, Vehicle Design Group where he's worked for the past 15 months. He was the team leader for the joint University of Maryland and Universidad de Carlos uh, the third undergraduate team. Ben, please take it away when you are ready. Yeah, Nick, could you give John control of the of the keyboard? Uh, Mike, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. That is Ben Dobson. Okay. So, do you want to present? Okay. Or do you want I apologize to... for that. That's okay. Sure, I, I can go ahead and present. Okay. Doesn't doesn't look like I have control yet though. Okay. There we go. All right. Uh, so my name is Ben Dobson. I was the team leader for the joint uh, Carlos the Third University in Spain and University of Maryland team for the undergraduate Vertical Flight Society uh, student design competition sponsored by Airbus last year. Uh, today, what I'd like to go through is uh, our process for designing the aircraft, how we distilled the requirements from the RFP, uh, selected configuration, uh, sized the aircraft, the rotor, the chose our engines, uh, transmission, uh, and then our airframe design and mission equipment. Here's a quick walk around of our single main rotor uh, six-bladed helicopter. We called it the TAR, which is a mountain goat that is indigenous to the Himalayan region. Uh, we felt that that ability to climb high was something that we wanted to emulate in our aircraft. The 2018-2019 RFP had a thesis statement that said, uh, what would a rotor craft look like when specifically designed to perform advanced medical services up to the highest peaks of the planet? What technologies uh, could enable such a vehicle? Could it be used for other purposes as well? And from the RFP, we saw three high level requirements. Number one, to design an extreme altitude rescue helicopter uh, with medical capabilities for the world's highest peaks. Designing technologies which would aid to the rescue capabilities of the aircraft and design the helicopter with extra mission capabilities as well. Specific requirements that we pulled out from the RFP that would become some of our most challenging uh, de design requirements were to conduct a hoagie for 30 minutes at 8,870 uh, 8, meters tall, which is about the uh, height of Mount Everest, complete the mission profile in three hours or less, conduct the mission with three crew 
one pilot, one co-pilot who would also work as an EMS, and then one rescue worker meet all FAA and EASA requirements and use technologies that are currently on the market. So technologies that would have high TRLs. There was also a bonus task to use Altair software for weight optimization. The mission profile was split into three legs where you take off from a large international airport, conduct a cruise for 135 kilometers where you would land at a higher altitude, smaller airport, where you were given time to refuel, then conduct a second leg of the mission, which would be to climb to altitude, cruise for another 28 kilometers, Hogi for 30 minutes while conducting the rescue mission, add passengers, then descend back to the smaller airport where you could refuel and then continue on to the larger airport, another 135 kilometers. And we chose a uh, cruise speed of 160 knots at um, for our main cruise in order to conduct the total mission time in less than three hours. In order to select a configuration that was both innovative but also fit into the requirements of the RFP, our, the selection process that we went through was first to go uh, and, and really look at all the requirements in the RFP. We took those requirements, distilled them into 11 design drivers, uh, for example, um, safety, which all had something quantifiable to define them. And for us, safety meant uh, safety of the passengers, the injured per persons who would be on the ground, which could be quantified by the downwash velocity of the rotor. Uh, we then used the analytical hierarchy process to weight the importance of the drivers in order to score the 18 configurations that we looked at. Now, we divided the 18 configurations into four categories and put them into a pew matrix. We selected the highest scoring configuration in each category and then continued to compare to select the final configuration. Here was our grouping. We had single main rotors, uh, coaxial rotors, a uh, multiple rotors group, and a transition aircraft group. Ultimately, we chose a conventional single main rotor. And the primary reason for that was it is a proven design. It's simple, which would reduce costs and low and and you know it's a has high TRLs. And we could also optimize this configuration for hover at the high altitude, which was easily the most difficult requirement in the RFP. In order to size the aircraft, uh, we looked at what would be the most stringent requirement. Would it be the speed requirement or would it be the hover requirement? And high altitude hover uh, was the most stringent requirement from the RFP. And so we conducted trade studies to look at aspect ratio, disc loadings, tip speeds, and the number of blades. Ultimately, we chose a six-bladed helicopter um, and aimed for a disc loading of about five, five and a half pounds per square foot uh, in order to minimize the downwash velocity that the rescuees would be receiving during a rescue. Uh, some of the performance characteristics of our aircraft um, show that we have a 9,200 meter hover ceiling. And we also thought of, we, we prioritize safety and so we looked and found that the OEI capability, uh, the aircraft could hover with one engine 
up to 4,000 meters, which is not the 9,200 uh, re um, requirement from the RFP for conducting the mission, but it's, it adds a, a significant amount of safety should the missions be conducted on mountain peaks that were lower than uh, 4,000 meters. Like I said earlier, our cruise speed was selected to be 160 knots. In order to uh, conduct the mission in the appropriate amount of time, um, Now on to the rotor design. Um, as stated, the rotorcraft is a six-bladed rotor that we optimized for hover due to the, the really high altitude requirement in the RFP. We selected a large rotor diameter in order to uh, minimize the amount of uh, the, the disc loading and ultimately the downwash. And the figure of merit at altitude um, is what we, we optimized the rotor for, the, the 0.807. Um, but one of the impacts of being a, a, an aircraft optimized for the high altitude is that there's a significant penalty at sea level. As we did uh, frequently during the design process, uh, we conducted many trade studies in order to pick an optimized uh, component. As for our airfoil, we looked at uh, four different airfoils using blade element momentum theory and selected the RC410. The structure of our rotor uh, uses composites um, in order to re help reduce weight in the aircraft. Um, there's a tungsten uh, leading edge mass in order to help with the CG of the blades. And most importantly, because this is a high altitude aircraft, icing is, a, is an important consideration when it comes to safety of the mission conducting. And so we had an ultrasonic de-ice uh, on the front of the blade using sound um, and we looked at multiple different methods ultimately we chose this because of its low power consumption when choosing the rotor hub um, we conducted uh, another trade study looking uh, at which would be the best choice for the aircraft uh, and we implemented the Pew matrix method that we had used to select the configuration. Ultimately, we decided to go with a hingeless rotor hub uh, because of its simple design, um, lower vibrations, and uh, good control power and stability. It utilizes flex beams, which provide flap and lead lag because it is able to twist and bend and then we also used a fairing around the hub uh, in order to reduce drag when deciding uh, what power method to use we looked at uh, turbo shaft engines diesel engines gas engines uh, batteries and fuel cells and hybrid configurations of any combination of these in order to be both innovative uh, you know looking at how batteries and other propulsion methods are you know better for the environment and are quickly uh, rising but ultimately the high power requirements for such a high altitude uh, hoagie for the aircraft determined that we needed to choose a turboshaft engine. And so we selected the Rolls-Royce 
RTM-322 uh, because of its power range was very similar to our, our hover power. In selecting uh, a transmission, we looked at multiple different configurations in order to optimize uh, for weight. Um, we looked at three different approaches, um, but ultimately chose the third approach, implementing a planetary system uh, that gave us the lightest configuration. And here is an exploded view of the planetary system that we implemented with the sun and planet bear and planet gears. Another uh, major requirement was uh, stabi uh, control during hover. Um, we were required to look at a 40 knot uh, gusting winds. So when selecting a tail rotor design, we wanted to make sure that we had a, a very safe design, uh, something that could have a lot of control during hover uh, and, and uh, gusts. So we looked at two different designs, uh, actually a, a coaxial um, tail rotor. Ultimately, though, we chose going with just one rotor because it would uh, reduce weight and a second set of blades was not necessary. Um, using blade -o momentum theory, we traded the number of blades on the tail rotor, twist, taper, and aspect ratio in order to uh, find the best design that would be able to stand up to gusts. Ultimately, we chose a fairly large four-bladed tail rotor um, in order to accomplish this, uh, the diameter being 2.7 meters, which is, is uh, a fairly large uh, tail rotor. And we went with four blades. And again, we optimized for high altitude, which had some penalties again at sea level. Uh, with the fuselage, um, our goal was to create a, a very simple design um, uh, and finally, um, we want to look at the mission equipment that we employed. Uh, the goal of our team during uh, for selecting what mission equipment would go on the aircraft um, was to really reduce the workload of the pilots, uh, make it as safe as possible for them to conduct the mission, um, reduce their workload so that they could focus on uh, actually getting you know visuals on on the flying. Uh, but we didn't. We also did not want to include redundant systems uh, because that would just be unnecessary weight and unnecessary uh, costs to the program. Uh, so some of the key things that we included on the aircraft was a terrain awareness system. Uh, these high-res maps would be displayed on the glass cockpit for the pilots uh, in case of, of poor uh, visibility conditions. They would have a, a terrain awareness system so that they could fly uh, and avoid obstacles. Um, because this is a high altitude uh, aircraft, uh, ice is, is always a, a problem. So for antennae and blades and for the windshield, we installed uh, de-icing um, so that at no point would the performance of these uh, protuberances be impacted um, and, and put the entire mission uh, at risk. Uh, we included some specific uh, 
mission equipment, rescue uh, specific equipment um, to really make the job of finding uh, injured personnel uh, easier. So we included a beacon locator, um, which is part of the, the RECO system, which uses uh, radar to uh, find people within a 100 meter uh, cone radius and uh, advanced imaging, thermal imaging, so that on a very cold mountain, it would it would be pretty easy to find uh, people, especially in the cases where um, you know we talk to to mountain climbers in order to select some of this equipment, and they said it, it's just as feasible that someone has fallen down a, a sixty foot crevice, or is could, if there was an avalanche, could be buried under the snow. So thermal imaging would make it a lot easier for the uh, pilots and rescue workers to find uh, the injured persons. Uh, and then we have a smart hoist um, that has embedded sensors that would help assist with the rescue. And then we would have a, a camera attached to the undercarriage of the aircraft uh, to train on the end of the hook in order uh, to give pilots a better visual uh, during the rescue. And then we also designed the cockpit to have windows um, to give them as, as wide of a field of view as possible, um, because sometimes it's just easier to look out the window and, and see what you're doing. Um, I would like to thank uh, Drs. Chopra, Bader, and Nagaraj for all of their help on this project, uh, as well as Kamli Badria, um, and then all of the people that we talked to and interviewed, um, you know, really helped a, a group of undergraduates have an appreciation for, for the world of, of helicopter design. And at this point, um, if there's any questions, I can answer them. All right, Ben, thank you. Um, for the audience, if you could please type your questions in the question box, I'll field them over to Ben as they come in. Ben, please stand by. All right, Ben from Rajneesh Singh, uh, what was the main driver for such a big drop in figure of merit at sea level? Um, so I think it was the it was the geometry of our blades was really optimized for the uh, the high altitude. Um, I I think we we were limited on on some of our, our twist and taper um, in that. So what was your design CT on Sigma at altitude? Uh, I don't have that number on me. I also noticed you had a really high tip speed of 750 feet per second. Do you recall what drove you to, to that very high tip speed? Um, this was, uh, a lot of these decisions were nearly two years ago now. Um, I, I don't know, but I, I do believe that some of, of what we did, we, you know, verified that we weren't, uh, weren't getting into dangerous territory with the tip mock. Um, you know, maybe we, we would need to, um, do some follow-up calculations on that. So, you know, I, I have a just a, 
a question for you. You know, since you've been working uh, at Sikorsky for the last 15 months, you know, and everything you've learned about aircraft design, working for a large OEM, uh, and then going back and, and looking at your undergraduate student design paper and, and putting this presentation together, can you give us a little commentary on, you know, um, how much your your thinking about aircraft design has evolved or, you know, what, how you feel about this design given the lessons that you've learned over the last year or so? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, you know, a lot of credit to our professors um, uh, taking, you know, students who, who really knew basically nothing about helicopters and, and um, you know, teaching us how to design an aircraft in, in seven months' time. Um, with the knowledge that I have now, um, I was really happy with a lot a lot of the, dis, the kind of overarching decisions that we we made. Um, and I you know feel like a lot of those uh, we justified. At the same time, I go, I have gone back and, and, you know, I was reviewing this after, you know, I probably haven't looked at this project since May of 2019. So, you know, quite some time. Um, and some of the numbers jumped out at me as going, oh, I'm not sure I, I would have done that specifically. Um, but for the most part, I, I think we, um, you know, we're, we're very successful in uh, looking at the RFP, understanding the requirements, and, and and really designing to the requirements. All right, I agree. Well, thank you very much for the presentation, and uh, this will conclude our uh, afternoon session of Aircraft Design 3. Thank you to everyone for who, uh, who dialed in or, or logged into the webinar, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the forum. Thank you very much. Oh, I think we're good to go, Nick. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you a lot.